So now we're in stage two sleep. If I woke you up in stage two sleep, you'd probably say, oh, I was asleep, but I just fell asleep. Regardless of whether you've been asleep for 30, 45 minutes, if I woke you up in stage two sleep, you'd say, I was asleep, but I just fell asleep. Your sort of sense of this is that it just happened. Um, that's an interesting thing about sleep is that we don't really track our time well. So um, when we get to sleep disorders, we'll talk about some of the issues concerning that. Although your brain is capable of um, timing your sleep, and we'll also talk about that. Finally, you get down to this deep sleep. This deep sleep is really important for people to um, feel restored and rejuvenated once they've awoken, to feel like you're ready for the day, is you need to get this sleep that's like stage three sleep, or what we call delta. Again, when I grew up, it was stage three and four, so if you ever see that in a textbook, you'll remember things used to be different. Human sleep didn't used to be different, it's just how we classify it. Um, now what happens is, in stage four sleep, your brain is basically taking a break, and then a lot of the functionality of that is to, a lot of the purpose for that slowing down in the sleep architecture is so that your brain can restock the shelves of the neurotransmitters that you've used up during your awakening hours. It's to re, uh, restore the, the order that uh, the chaotic day blew apart. And um, so stage four sleep is very slow sleep. If you, if you woke somebody up in stage, first of all, it's or stage three sleep. If, it's, if you woke somebody up in stage three sleep, if they're in Delta, if you watch their EEGs in Delta and you go to wake them up, you'd be like, I don't know, it's Karen laying there, right? Karen's this new meme. So Karen's laying there and she's passed out. She's snoring. And you're like, Karen, Karen, wake up. Karen, wake up. Karen's not waking up because she's in deep sleep. Also, you could maybe shake Karen, uh, if you know her and she's okay with you doing this. Again, don't go into Karen's room and, and bother her. She'll ask for the manager. But if you tried to even wake her up, it would be difficult to arouse her. She's, her brain is at such a low level of activity during stage three um, delta sleep, she's almost unreachable. Her brain has to really speed back up to get up to be awoken. So if you wake up during that period of sleep, you're gonna feel very drowsy and you're gonna feel very tired. So this is again, a lot of people try and time naps and what they're trying to do is to time to wake up in say a stage two sleep when they're um, just uh, in, this, in this level of activity where their brain's been rested. They don't wanna wake up or they don't wanna sleep so long that they get into stage three sleep and they're in delta and then they wake up and if you wake up from a nap and you feel exhausted and tired, it's probably because you woke up um, in stage three sleep. Those aren't the only stages of sleep. In fact, there's a really interesting stage of sleep that happens because your brain seems to go down the roller coaster, uh, down slower, 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 asleep. But then, in, in a cycle of about 45 minutes, let's say you go to bed at 10 o'clock, at about 10.45, what happens is your brain will speed back up, almost like it's awakening, but it doesn't go to an awakening state, it goes to something called REM. REM has a couple names, paradoxical sleep is what we call it, because the speeding back up on an EEG looks almost like you're back into that awake and aware stage, but yet you're in a very deep s sleep state, um, and some several, cool things are going on in your physiology. One of them is, is that your brain begins to sig signals from the pons. I don't point to my neck, but it, it's down here at the base of my skull where the, the um, hind brain, that's the part of the brain that has the medulla, the cerebellum and the pons, it sends a signal from the pons to all your musculature in your body and it says paralyze everything. So it, it's like a switch turns off, you know, a valve turns off. So the signals from your brain, the activity of your brain, can't reach your body. Like right now, if I want to raise my hand, the signal up here in the left motor cortex has to go out to my right hand to, to make the arm move up. But if you cut it off at the pons, if the pond says, nope, we're not sending any more signals down, my body will be paralyzed. Uh, and so if you know about the structure of the brain, the pons is basically the level of the, of the brain where the third cranial nerve is. The third cranial nerve, for those of you who are going on to medical school, ooh, ah, oh, to touch and feel, uh, is the oculomotor nerve. So it's the one that moves your eyes. Um, the first cranial nerve uh, is your olfactory nerve. So it's ooh, ah, oh, it's olfactory, and then ocular, and then oculomotor. And that third one, so everything else is below. Everything that moves on your face, your jaw, tongue, you know, your, um, your, 
swallowing and all these sort of volitional activity you have of your face that come out of your cran uh, cranial nerves from your brain that's before your spinal cord starts the peripheral nervous system that goes out to operate sort of your your head your facial nerve right the glossopharyngeal all these you don't need to know those right now but they're all paralyzed but above the third cranial nerve those aren't paralyzed so the brain's activity is sent out to the one two and three so it's this rich area for your brain to have activity and then although your eyes are shut that's this um is your third cranial nerve is still moving and so what you'll see if you watch somebody in rem sleep which is a strange thing to do sneak into karen's room and watch her during rem sleep um but if, if you have babies they're in rem sleep like all the time like newborn babies they sleep in rem sleep so much and it's a really cool thing to know why um, so REM sleep happens after you've been asleep in the night for a while in an adult, but um, why you need REM sleep and what's neat about REM sleep that we found out is that if you learn new uh, neural network patterns during the day, let's say you learn something new, you learn to juggle or you learn to uh, water ski or I don't know water ski, I don't water ski, you learn to shoot a hoop with your left hand, right? This is a new neural circuitry pattern for your body to move. Or let's say you learn about REM sleep. So tonight when you go to sleep, if you've never learned about REM sleep, it might be something that your brain rehearses. And it rehearses it during REM. So first what happens is it gets to sleep and it puts all the you know, jars and the bags back on the shelf and it restocks everything and it gets ready for the next day. That's that deep sleep, that theta, but then it speeds back up and it does these rehearsals these REM rehearsals, and it's really neat. Some researchers took rats and taught them a new task. Doesn't matter what it is. They taught them to do something new. They watched their brain do this new neural circuitry, and so they had a new uh, pattern, a behavioral pattern that was in, in conjunction with the new neural circuitry. And then at night, they took those rats, and they watched their brain during REM sleep recapitulate the same thing. It's almost like they rehearsed it. Uh, if you're in theater, you know, you need rehearsals before you go out to have your first show. And so your brain during sleep, after you've slept for a sufficient period of time, is going to rehearse these things in your brain again and again and again, only during REM. If you say, take those rats and you deprive them of that REM sleep, you know, you wake them up when their brain was about to go into REM sleep, you wake them up and you deprive them of that over the night, even though they got that deep restful sort of stage three um, theta sleep they're not going to learn as well as the other rats. So this is a very important point for you uh, in this lecture. You thought this lecture would be most important for me telling you what drugs did to you, but um, the most important point of this section of our book is that your brain needs sleep for several reasons. One, for metabolism. Now, what you might not know about sleep is that you drop your uh, temperature uh, during the night because you don't move as much. And when you don't move as much, your muscles don't need as much um, energy. Most of the calories you take in are just to keep your muscles warm. So it's not like you drop down into sort of a torpor state like a bear does or, or a hibernate like say a fish does. You, you do drop your metabolism down every night and um, probably why we need blankets, right? Because uh, we, we drop our level of our temperature of our, of our bodies down at night and that's partly to conserve metabolism so you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and then you know if you sleep for eight hours it's not like you need to wake up and have a snack. It's because you're not using as many calories. You're not putting in as many calories. So what your body's doing is it's metabolizing over the long haul. I believe that sleep is one of the best weight loss mechanisms to stay healthy. If you get a consistent uh, eight hours of sleep a night, and um, I know most of you don't because I've been teaching college students for the better part of two decades. Uh, I know you don't get enough sleep, and I know you don't get that eight hours that you need. If you're struggling with energy, if you're struggling with weight loss, really try to focus not on the exercise and not on the portion control those are all excellent things focus specifically on getting good restful sleep because your body is metabolizing during that time and you're not putting input in it's almost like a workout at night but rem is what's happening during rem is that your brain is rehearsing the things that you learn during the day so i know we don't go to school anymore like we used to but let's say we were in regular college not this weird uh, online college. If we were in regular college and you were about to study for a test for tomorrow morning, and let's say it's at 1030 at night right now, you have the option of staying up and, you know, reading this book for another four hours. And, you know, you're, 
you're exhausted 2.30 in the morning and you're just reading the book and you go to bed and you wake up 6.30, take a shower, get to school and get to your class and take, take this exam. That's option A. Option B is that it's 10.30 at night and you look at this and you're like, I'm exhausted. I'm not gonna go grab a Red Bull or Monster or whatever the crap that you guys drink is or a coffee if you're a normal person. Far more caffeine, by the way. Um, you're not gonna do that. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go to bed and you're gonna wake up at 6.30 and you're gonna take a shower, you're gonna go to school. Now option A, you'd think that that person who had four more hours of study is gonna do better on the exam than say option B, which was to go to bed right when they felt tired and get a sufficient night's sleep and rest and then wake up rejuvenated and ready for the day. Option B will outperform option A. I know that's counterintuitive to you. I know you don't believe it because you're like, well, I used to cram for, for classes in high school. You don't understand this. I'm telling you something new and so it's challenging what you believe. Um, beliefs that you've operated on, right? That's the, that's the classic thing is that it's beliefs are rules for action. And so you believe that staying up and cramming is gonna help. What I'm telling you is your brain's not oriented that way. Sleep is imperative. Sleep is so much, imp so much more important, I would suggest you to take option B every time rather than option A. I know that that's difficult to hear, but try it out, see how it goes. Uh, option C is that you've studied sufficiently so that you can go to bed even early uh, the night before and you, you're ready for the test and you have a refreshing morning, you know, take a, a good leisurely walk in the morning and eat a healthy breakfast and um, review your notes before class. Like that's, that's the best, right? But if you had only option A and option B, then, then go with option B, which is to get that sleep that's necessary. REM sleep is something, the book says this and, and other people say this, that if you wake somebody up and they're in REM sleep, that they were dreaming again. No, they weren't. If you wake someone up, they will have the perception that what used to be happening when they were asleep, unconscious, asleep, so they couldn't have had a conscious thought, there couldn't have been a narrative story, they will report dreaming more often if we wake them up in REM sleep. So researchers have just said, without thinking really about this, they've said, oh, you must have been dreaming in sleep. We don't have conclusive proof of that. You can't interview someone who's asleep because if they can interview and interact with you back and forth, they're not asleep. Now, many of you go, well, what about lucid dreaming? Okay. Lucid dreaming basically refers to this idea that you could become aware that you were in a dream. Think the movie Inception, right? If you're aware you're in a dream, you're not dreaming. So if you're like, well, I'm in this scary dream and my, my daddy told me to, to just, you know, if a monster's chasing me in the dream and I know I'm dreaming, turn around and just kill that monster. He's right, do, do that. Um, but if you're in that state, you're probably awake in an alpha and just with your eyes closed, resting, you're not really in a sleep state. If I'm looking at EEG and I could talk to you about what was happening, you would be awake when that lucid dreaming was happening. Again, because if you're unconscious, you can't report to me what's happening and I as a researcher, scientist can't record data on your cognitive experiences during that neurological pattern. It also makes perfect sense to understand that, that as you wake up, let's say you wake up from that super deep like delta sleep, stage three, you're conked, you're out, and I, somehow I shake Karen, get up Karen, and Karen wakes up. She's not likely to report dreaming. Well, why? Because what was happening in her brain that she's now waking up from was real low level activity. That's not like conscious reality. It's not even akin to it, it's, it's, it's dissimilar. Um, and so when you wake somebody up in REM sleep where we call it paradoxical because it almost looks like you're conscious, there's not a big transition from that into conscious level awareness. And so my thought is that people report dreaming because their brain's trying to make sense of what it was just doing and they tell a story about it. That's what humans do. We organize stories around it. We organize our experiences into a narrative form and that's a normal human interaction. So where dreams come in is that your brain was doing something really weird that you didn't know what it was, rehearsing those neural patterns that you did during the day. And when you wake up from it, now you're conscious, you go, whoa, that was weird. I had this dream that I was doing this. Uh, one last thing about REM. I told you that babies spend most of their time in REM. And the reason that they spend most of their time in REM is because it's super important that babies uh, get enough sleep 
and if you've if you've had an infant in your in your life you know this they sleep all the time and they sleep hard and the reason they sleep hard in that REM sleeps so much is that they're learning so much everything's new to them right so when we learn something new as an adult and then we go to sleep that night our brain rehearses those patterns in REM sleep babies are learning so much everything's new to them the whole world the whole experiences their sensory perceptions are all new they're just trying to organize their lives and so they spend a lot of time in REM sleep as you grow older the sleep architecture that's sort of the way in which you sleep it changes most people need eight hours of sleep at night so if you are like me and like everybody else you need eight hours of sleep if you're not getting that please address that i am going to next tell you a something i almost hesitate to tell you because then you're gonna be like oh that must be me it's not you just like the coronavirus thing you don't have coronavirus why very few people have been diagnosed with it yet so that's why I would say this is also an unlikely thing. Yes, there's a coronavirus. Yes, there are these people who genetically don't need as much sleep to get the same level of rest, same level of rejuvenation, same level of brain activity as you or I would need. We need eight hours, but there are some people who need like six hours of sleep. And that's it, that's all they need. Now, there are women, okay, so women uh, who have a specific genetic abnormality or a change, a mutation, right? They're almost, uh, they're almost advanced, right? You'd think, oh, they're like uh, evolved. It's just a variation. And for them, they only need six hours of sleep. You're probably not that person. Let's say you're a guy, you're not them, right? You're probably also not them because it's like less than 1% of people have this sort of genetic mutation and, and they, that mutation allows for them to sleep less. And, and I ask my students this a lot. And uh, so I want you to think deeply about this. Let's say I developed a pill, right? made some pill up, right? I, I'm a pharmaceutical company and I make this pill. And the pill has this characteristic. If you take this pill, you will only sleep one hour every night. You'll get all the um, benefits of having slept, say, eight hours, all the rejuvenation and the focus and the, the neural networking that happens during REM. All that will be done in one hour. No side effects to the pill. Would you take it? And this sort of goes into a a deep-seated place of like, well, why do we sleep and what's sleep for? Let's say that I, d I took that pill, what would my life be like? Well, you know, my kids would go to bed about nine, wife go to bed about 11, and then I would just be up until what? Five in the morning from 11 to five doing what? Doing, doing what? Uh, importance of what? what? What would my life be like? Why would I do that? And so I wouldn't take the pill. I'd go to sleep. Lay down right next to my wife. It's a great place to go to sleep. It's comfortable, I like my bed. Why, why would I need those extra hours? If you feel like you need those extra hours, that says something about what's going on here, what's going on here, and how you've organized your life. You need to take into account, are you getting sufficient rest? And are you putting too much on your plate? Every day there's leftovers, you have too much on your plate. Now I'm using this as an analogy for what you're doing in your life. If you say I can't sleep eight hours a night because I have a job and I have school and I have family obligations. I have a group that I'm a part of and I like to watch Netflix shows and I, and I have all these things I want to do. I have these, uh, I'm part of a sports team or whatever. And you can't get sufficient sleep. I'll tell you this, that's dangerous. Um, other studies have shown that specifically women, again, women have better, better capability of sleep, and that's cool that some of them can sleep six hours, but they also have all of you, all of you ladies, has been shown by science that if you get less than five hours of sleep a night, or more than 10 hours, and we'll talk about that in a second, but less than five hours of sleep at night consistently for three years, it increases your risk of cancers, you know, the breast, ovarian, um, vaginal, uterine, all those, all the other ones I couldn't get. But your risk of that, if you sleep five hours a night or less, it exponentially increases your risk of cancer. And you gotta be like, well, where's that coming from? It makes perfect sense. If you're not giving your body sufficient time to restore, it can't, it can't fight off what are called free radicals, these sort of precancerous cells that develop in areas of your tissue. And so you, you really have an obligation to yourself to sleep well and an obligation to everybody else right it's not just yourself you your your life is not just your own it's you it's your families it's your your siblings and your parents and your kids and your nephews and nieces aunts uncles it's your neighbors it's your community it's me it's a professor 
we need each other, we need you. And if you're doing something that's making you not thrive, even if you can't do it for yourself, do it for the people you love, do it for the people you care for, get sleep, it's important. I sound really serious about this, but this is a very serious thing that sleep deprivation, we know lowers your immune system response. So although you're unlikely to have gotten coronavirus by now, um, if you don't sleep enough, you're more likely to get it. So if you're one of those anxious people out there, I could just scare you into sleeping more, right? Um, it's more healthy. Uh, and I don't believe that there will be a pill that's developed to allow us to get that type of rest because I think there's physiologically, biologically, and even cognitively a need for rest, a need for taking a break. Um, notice I wear different clothes in these. I set up in different places. I don't just, you might just be watching me straight through, but I need rest. I need breaks just like anybody else. And if we don't incorporate that, if we're not tracking how well we're functioning, if I'm sitting here and I'm going like, stage one sleep is like, uh, it's that stuff where you, you feel drow you're drowsy and then you fall asleep. And if I'm not lecturing well, if I don't have the energy to do this, I need to be monitoring my own um, levels of participation in whatever activity I'm doing and then make sure that I have sufficient energy to do so by number one, looking at the sleep that I'm getting. So before uh, you do anything, uh, sit down and calculate how much sleep you're getting. Another thing that teenagers tend to do, um, I'm noticing this because some of my friends have teenagers now, is that they go to bed later and sleep later. That's a natural phenomenon. So um, doctors, pediatricians have studied um, puberty and, and the growth. It is natural for kids when they enter puberty to begin to fall asleep later in the day. Now you might well say, well, why, why is that? Our, our brain out, outside is really light right now. So what's happening is, is I'm getting a lot of light into my eyes. If you remember that, goes through, here's a little review for your eye. Goes through your cornea, right? It goes in the middle of your iris, that hole that I don't like to call something because it's not there, it's not a thing. Uh, to your lens, bent, refracted through that aqueous, vitreous, vitreous humor, hits your retina, and your retina sends a signal down your optic nerve. Now that optic nerve, when it goes into your brain, it crosses hemispheres, right? So the information that's coming in from this side goes to the other side uh, of my brain. And when you take biopsych or you take some neuroanatomy class, you'll learn about uh, how, how the brain organizes vision. But here's the part that I want you to know about. When it crosses, that's called the optic chiasm. Chiasm is the, chi is the Greek letter for X, you know, like you, you see that X. So it's crossing these optic nerves. Now, cells that sit right above the crossing, think intersection. Uh, so it's sitting right above the intersection. Think like a police camera, right? The ones that make sure you don't run red lights. Um, it's looking down and this, this group of cells called the supra, supra is just Latin for above, chiasmatic, meaning related to this intersection, nucleus, nucleus just means group of cells. Their job's just to look at the traffic coming in through my eyes. And if it's bright outside, they send a signal back to a part of my brain called the pineal gland that secretes melatonin. Melatonin you may have heard of because people can take it. You can take a pill form of it, but your brain naturally produces it. And it naturally produces it only when it wants to get your brain ready to go to sleep, to prepare you for sleep, to take you from that beta to an alpha to stage one, right? It, it, it wants to prepare your brain for that. Um, it doesn't produce any of the melatonin if there's light coming in, right? So there's all this, I'm sitting outside, Let's see. I'm sitting outside, bright, beautiful day out here. And because it's a bright, beautiful day, I'm getting tons, tons of light into my face. And that light in my face is telling that suprachiasmatic nucleus to pause the pineal glands production of melatonin. This makes perfect sense. A couple things to note about this. The light in land animals, in most land animals, is the time giver or the Zeitgeber is the, the German term that people have used to describe this. For animals like us who are awake during the day, when we see light, it suspends our brain's production of that melatonin. Uh, how many of you have TVs or, or, or phones right next to your bed when you're sleeping at night? And the problem with that is that it's interrupting the signals for your brain to prepare yourself for sleep. So if you think you have problems sleeping, it might be because you haven't prepared yourself for sleep. And that's just one of those things. If you have, where's my phone? 
There it is. Okay. So if I have my phone next to me, I don't know. It's not open. It's it's off. Anyway, if imagine that light, right? That light that's going up in your face. If I have my phone next to me in bed and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna lay down and I'm gonna go to sleep. Okay, but I'm just sitting there, tap tap tap, and there's this light shining in my face. Oh, there is something happening on my phone. Look at that. All right, so we're back to talk about how to prepare yourself for sleep. How do you get ready for bed? A couple things to note. It's important if you're gonna sleep those eight hours that you have a couple things in mind. A, realize you've never failed to fall asleep. You, you can't. In fact, if you don't get sleep, you'll die. They were not allowed to sleep and it took them about a month, but, but what happened during that time is that their brain stopped functioning in keeping them aware of what was happening around them. They were hallucinating. They were, they were delusional about what was happening and uh, they lost sense of reality. And then eventually, because they didn't get that sleep, because they kept being awakened and they kept being disturbed, their bodies, the organs shut down. They stopped functioning. They need sleep. So that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a primary need for you. So note that. It's like breathing, but it takes longer for, you know, if you stop breathing, you're dead in a couple minutes. But if, if you stop sleeping, you're dead in, in a month. So it's that serious. Um, you could go longer without food then you could go without sleep. Think about that. And think how much effort and time you put into and thinking about what you're gonna eat, how you're gonna eat, what you should put in your body. You should be thinking just as seriously about how well you sleep. So how do you prepare yourself to go to sleep? A lot of people think that they have problems with sleep. Now there's a couple um, disorders of sleep we'll talk about. One's insomnia, one is narcolepsy, and then another one's sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is by far the most serious because it affects more people despite the fact that narcolepsy could kill you. Um, most people think they have the least serious of these problems, insomnia. They think they have that problem. A lot of people don't know that they have um, sleep apnea because, well, you're asleep when you're, when you're doing this. But you should take seriously how to prepare yourself for sleep. So what do you need to do? You need a safe place. You need a consistent place. So if you're sleeping in different places, that's not healthy for you. Your body's not going to do well with that. If you don't feel safe in the place you are, your brain's not gonna allow you to get into the deep sleep that really, uh, you're gonna be alert and aware. Think of like men in combat. If, if they're sleeping at all, they're sleeping in very short chunks and they're not sleeping well and deep and not feeling rested when they woke up. So you need to feel safe. And that could be safe um, in all sorts of ways because your brain has a narrative about what's happening in your life and it's keeping tabs on what's dangerous and what's not. So you need to be safe, consistent. You need to have it dark. Um, we know this from studying swing shift workers that they have terrible sleep patterns. It really screws up people to be awake at night working and then come home at night and it's like bright during the day and I'm supposed to go lay down and sleep for eight hours. It's not good for people. It's bad for their, um, it's bad for their life. It's bad for their occupation. It's bad for their performance of work. Far more accidents happen on people who are on swing shifts than happen people who sleep normally during the night. Um, so those are some things to note. Uh, a lot of people have fans or white noise makers. The problem with that is not that you can't get to sleep with them, but that you become reliant or habituated to this pattern of, I've got to have this, my special blankie or my special fan. Um, I had a friend who once, you know who you are, you know who you are, used to watch um, Star Wars every night. It was like a, a habitual thing that this person would do. And they would watch Star Wars every night just to go to sleep. Um, and the problem with that is, is that it would prevent them from going to sleep, right? There's, it's a great story. It's a, it's a classic archetypal story of the hero. Uh, you wanna watch it, it's compelling. So you don't sleep. Same thing if you got your phone, right? If my phone's telling me I got all this, Oh, I have a, look at that. I've got, something's happening there. I got a recent phone call. Oh, there's a work email. I, I'm wasting my time. And so take your phone. You, you're probably not gonna be willing to do this, but turn it off. Okay. Why? Well, because you don't need it when you're unconscious. What it will do mostly is prevent you from sleeping. It'll buzz, it'll send you notification alerts, and it's gonna disturb your sleep. And then you won't be as healthy, as happy, as productive. 
you have a weird dependence on your phone that is not something that you probably recognize until you try and do this. So I want you to take your phone, I want you to turn it off. If you are not willing to do that, let's do this. Let's put it on the other side of the room from you uh, where you have to lay down in bed to go to sleep, but it's somewhere that you couldn't reach it. In that sense, you might have a better time of putting off until tomorrow uh, what you should worry about till tomorrow and worrying about today, getting to sleep and having a good restful experience unconsciously so that you wake up ready to encounter whatever that phone has for you the next day. Uh, again, I think you should probably evaluate your relationship to those phones because it's dangerous and it's changing people's idea of what they need to pursue for, for themselves with goals and, and I don't think it's healthy for you. So try to, to do that, get that phone away. Don't have Star Wars on or any, um, any TV for that matter. I can't imagine trying to watch the news these days to fall asleep. Um, it's not something that brings you peace and comfort. It's not something that's allowing you to relax and feel safe. So don't watch TV. Don't watch videos. Don't watch, you know, try not to laugh videos, right? All these things are engaging your brain and not allowing it to get into that transition into sleep. Um, all right, so I think that's it. Let's talk about sleep disorders. The biggest sleep disorder, I believe, is lack of sleep, but that's not a classification. Um, and because people have variable needs for sleep. Also, as you get older, you need less sleep. When you get to be my age, you don't need eight hours. I say I do because that's what's healthy, but technically when you get to be above 40, you need about seven, above 50, six and a half, above 60, maybe six. Uh, and when you're 80, some people are sleeping like five hours a night and they're fine. Uh, as we age, we need less sleep. Um, I don't know why. There's a bunch of theories about that. Um, but right now, you're probably not 80. So when I say to you, you need uh, to, to get eight hours of sleep, trust me on this one and have that be your goal and move towards that goal because it will be healthy for you and you'll feel better. Um, you'll also learn more of this stuff, right? Uh, sleep disorders, the ones that we'll talk about are insomnia, narcolepsy, and sleep apnea. See, I couldn't remember. I didn't get enough sleep last night. Uh, so let's talk about insomnia. Insomnia is this, well, it's a, it, it's a multifaceted thing because you could have problems staying asleep or you could have problems falling asleep. Now, those are technically two different issues. If I was a physician and I'm seeing you and you come into me, you say, doc, I can't, I can't fall asleep. That to me isn't as concerning as if you said, Doc, I fall asleep, I'm fine with that, but then I can't stay asleep. That would alert me to, that this might be more of a medicalized issue, a metabolic issue uh, that we'll have to address from a medical standpoint rather than the psychological issue, which um, I've kind of given you a little bit of a roadmap into how to set yourself up to go to sleep. Um, and that's that if you have problems going to sleep, A, I, as, as if I'm your doctor and you say that to me, I'm not, I'm not saying you're a liar. What I'm saying is people don't know how long it takes them to fall asleep. So uh, when people are doing two things, they're very bad at tracking time, having sex and falling asleep. So if you think you know how long that was lasting, you're way off. Um, when we ask people, okay, how long did it take you to fall asleep last night? And then we've watched their EEG recordings. They have no concept of how long it took them to fall asleep. Uh, it ha it's much more to do with how they feel waking up with what they believe about how long it took to fall asleep. So if you come in and say, I can't fall asleep, and let's say I order a sleep study. So I, I send you down to the neurology lab and they hook you up with these leads and that comes down to this electrical wire and you wear it in a little bag and you, you take that and you sleep with that overnight. And then I, next day, you know, maybe they have Wi-Fi now, I don't know. It used to be that you had to take it back to the doctor and they'd download the data. Probably have Wi-Fi, I could probably watch you sleep in my office or whatever. Uh, it's been a while since I've been in hospitals. But let's say I can watch you fall asleep. Then I could know if your assessment of that problem is accurate. Do you have problems falling asleep? Obviously this person's laying down. I can see that their movement's not happening. I can see that they're in bed. And you know, maybe I have your phone data and I say, look, the phone's off. He's not, he or she's not active on their phone. Um, and you report that it's quiet and dark and you feel safe. 
and then you're having problems falling asleep, you might qualify as having insomnia. Now, uh, then I'd want to investigate, well, why do you have insomnia, right? What might it be? It might be that you, you know, I have friends who will go to the, I see them, I see a friend who lives on my street. I'll be out in my garage late at night, you know, 10, 30, 11 at night, and he's running. He's like, ah, oh, I'm going to go do my exercise at 10, 30 at night, 11 at night. If you do a whole bunch of exercise super late at night, your body is going to be in this aroused state and it has a much harder time falling to sleep. Um, something to know for kids too, and this is just a helpful hint for all of you out there that are going to choose the greatest job in the world. Um, when you get a kid to go to sleep, you need to be thinking about preparing their brain and their behavior for sleep. You don't want to go... Uh, lights on, full blast, everybody's up and we're active and playing a fun board game or wrestling and, and then all of a sudden you have bedtime. Their bodies, their brains, their physiology isn't prepared for it. If you want to do bed at night and let's say it's 8 o'clock and you want them to bed by 9, you might do all that fun board games and watch some TV, some active comedy or something and you're laughing and you're ha ha ha, ha you're up, you're up. At eight o'clock, turn off the TV so there's no noise, there's no lights, there's no flashing, and do a routine, which is, you know, wash your face, brush your hair, you know, maybe my kids don't brush their hair, they're boys, um, brush your teeth, maybe take a shower, get into your pajamas, uh, and then maybe read a book quietly, and then turn the lights out. And what you should do is you should only have the lights on in the room you're in so everywhere else is dark. And then as you get to a place where it's time to go to bed, you turn out those lights. Now, a lot of kids want, um, want night lights, okay? Uh, because they feel unsafe or they, they don't like not being able to see. They're not used to it. They feel insecure. That's normal. A lot of kids are like that. My suggestion to you is so that the light, make the light indirect to them so that it lights up a part of the room but that it doesn't shine you know led right into their eyeballs as they're laying in bed because it'll do the same thing it's going to disrupt their brain's normal pattern secreting melatonin getting the brain ready to go from that high level activity of awake consciousness into unconscious sleep patterns uh where was i oh yeah insomnia most people think that have insomnia think they have insomnia they don't actually have it there's other things going on a lot of times, people who can't fall asleep, they have this issue. This is a psychological issue. And it has to do with worry. Um, this also has to do a lot more with females in my experience and in the literature. So I'm not, I'm not sexist here. There are differences in men and women. Um, women tend to ruminate. Ruminate is the term for when um, animals chew... Uh, grass like a cow or a sheep or something they chew grass they swallow it they barf it back up into their mouth and they chew the cud right this is a normal part of their digestive process that sounds gross to us but I'm using it as an analogy for thought processes and, and the ways that a lot of people women specifically will um, rethink over a, a situation right they went to a class and then they met with some friends and one of their friends wasn't there and they're not sure what's going on with their friend and so they might think about it while they're there in class and go, well, where's my friend? Why isn't he here? Is he okay? Right? Worry or stress about him. When she goes to lay down at night, uh, you know, she called him, she texted him, she emailed him, and she goes to lay down at night. She might start chewing on that again. Well, does it mean he doesn't want to be around me? Does it mean he's having problems with his family? Does it mean he's, you know, maybe he's uh, making bad decisions? That She'll start making all these uh, possibilities in her mind and just really just churning through all these um, variable outcomes that could happen with it. That's a normal and natural thing, but the problem with that is, is that you're distracting yourself from your duty at the time, which is to get to sleep. And then to deal with that situation, I'm making up this situation as I go, so it's not maybe not the perfect one, but you understand, whatever it is that you're worried about, whatever it is you're spending time chewing the cut on, uh, is it valuable for you? And should you be doing that now? Because if you're trying to fall asleep, that should be the task, that should be the goal at hand. Not, I'm gonna solve the problems for my friend socially or, or relationally now. Now is not the time to do that. Tomorrow, when you're slept through the night, 
when you've had the uh, genius insights that people have when they sleep, you might be much better at solving those problems than now. And if you chew on the cud now, if you ruminate now on it, you're gonna not get a sufficient level of sleep. And then you're gonna have more stress because you're not gonna feel rested, you're not gonna have the energy. You're gonna want to get that rest. So if you can, if, if you find yourself thinking too much, for lack of a better term, sorry guys, I'm, I'm in, intimating that we don't think enough. I'm gonna leave it there. But if you're thinking too much, now, it's not that it's bad to think about that. It's not as bad to think about friends. It's good to think. When you're having thoughts, that's good. You should be constantly challenging yourself. But when it's time for bed, you need to put that to sleep too. So some ways that people have found easy to do is they write it down. So you say, well, what, are, what am I worried about? What am I, what am I, some people have this nebulous sort of almost generalized anxiety that they have. That's harder to deal with. But if it's a specific thing that you have, you're sitting there chewing on, I say chewing, you're not masticating your rolling it over in your head. I want you to write it down and then look at it and say to yourself, you don't have to say it out loud because if somebody's there with you, they'll think you're weird. Um, if they're there with you, it's okay that they think they're weird. So go ahead and say it out loud. Tell them what you're doing. Say, I, I'm worrying about this right now and I'm not going to be able to solve it right now. So I'm going to write this down and I am going to address this for five minutes tomorrow morning. I, I'm going to, maybe I'll set my alarm five minutes early. And I'm going to address thinking about this then. I'm going to put this down now so I don't have to think about it anymore. And I'm going to think about this tomorrow morning. That's when I'm going to continue to think about this particular issue. If you do that, it will free your body to fall asleep, get the rest. When you wake up, you're going to have better insights. You're going to be a better problem solver. Um, if you spend time worrying a lot, it's gonna reflect your sleep patterns being more poor than they could be. So try to address those things. Um, secondly, if you're having problems falling asleep, you might wanna do some guided imagery, right? So this is where you take your brain and you say, okay, I need to find a place where I feel calm, relaxed, uh, not too active, not thinking about a lot. Maybe you imagine yourself, um, I imagine myself uh, in water and just gently swimming and then taking breaths and like if you swim in water if you're just swimming along the top and you hold your breath maybe four seconds I'll, I'll maybe count in my mind one two three four and then i'll breathe out right so you, you don't take big deep breaths you don't go because <gasps> that actually increases um your awareness and your alertness so don't take big breaths but just notice yourself breathing and then count in your mind to say a count of four just hold it before you breathe out. If you do that and you do some guided imagery where you feel safe and comfortable and, and you're not thinking, you're just experiencing comfort in your physical corporeal body, that can be really, really effective to fall asleep. The idea of counting sheep, I think the repetitiveness with which people do that is interesting, but I don't think that it's really healthy because you have the, this goal of, well, when am I gonna stop counting sheep and fall asleep? Really, the goal should be sleep should happen uh, another thing to do that uh, is something that people do in their meditative practices is notice their breathing. Um, this puts me to sleep. I could fall asleep right now doing a video. If I just started thinking about my breathing, I'd just, I'd fall off to, I'd fall off to sleep immediately. So that could be a very helpful thing for you if you're having problems falling asleep. All right, talk about narcolepsy next. Narcolepsy is this problem where people just fall asleep from awake to just. 60 miles an hour to hitting a brick wall asleep. That's actually dangerous, right? Think about somebody who's driving. Uh, they don't know when it's going to happen. It can be something that comes on rather more gradually than I'm, I'm giving the indication here that it happens just right uh, <laughs> as soon as you, you're driving 60 miles an hour on the freeway and you fall asleep. You might notice yourself falling asleep really quickly and some people with narcolepsy have different experiences with this, but it's this suddenness. Uh, of, of loss of consciousness. It's very sudden. Um, it's pretty scary for people. Uh, it's disturbing. It's often neurologically based. Uh, there's some genetics to it, so it comes from family. And you need to see a physician if you have narcolepsy, if we're, you're just falling asleep in the middle of the day. There could be some real neurologic problems going on. Uh, it's pretty rare. So not a lot of people have narcolepsy. Um, 
I do want to talk about the most common sleep disorder, which is sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is this issue where men, sorry guys, guys are having a tough time here. Um, we still get to pee standing up, right? <laughs> uh, mostly men. In fact, there's there's something about your neck size. Like if your neck size is above 17 and a half, like if you buy shirts and you're like you you buy it and your neck size is above 17 and a half, um, you are way more likely to have this problem. And this problem, sleep apnea, is that in the middle of your sleep, you're going to be falling asleep and then you stop breathing. Now, obviously, at night you breathe less, right? You don't need to oxygenate all your cells as much as you did. And so you slow your breathing down. Your respiration rate drops dramatically as you sleep. Temperature drops down, respiration rate, heart rate, everything slows down. But you actually stop breathing. And, and if, uh, if you have a partner who's there with you, they'll, they'll notice that a lot of the time. They'll say, he stopped breathing. I'm using he because almost everybody who has sleep apnea is male. So forgive me for taking cognitive shortcuts with gender. She'll know he's got sleep apnea because she'll say, in the middle of the night, he'll just go, <gasps> and he'll stop breathing like he's choking. It really worries partners, and it should. Um, turns out people then start breathing again, but they stop breathing for way too long. And what that has in the, in the brain is you're starving your brain of oxygen. And when you starve your brain of oxygen, it, it doesn't do what you think it does. It doesn't like slow down. It actually speeds up. So it wakes up people who are asleep, if they have sleep apnea, it wakes them up. And people who have sleep apnea tend to be obese. I'm making a lot of generalizations. You could be skinny and healthy and, and oh, female and have sleep apnea, but that'd just be super rare, so. Uh, most guys tend to be obese. Again, the thicker the neck, right? Um, there are some solutions to sleep apnea, which is to um, wear uh, something to improve airway. And oftentimes they'll have forced air. Uh, CPAP is the name of the machine that typically is um, given to people who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea. And, and it's an amazingly effective um, machine. Uh, there's even improvements on treating this. So don't be embarrassed that you have sleep apnea. Go get help because what's happening is you're not getting sufficient sleep. You're gonna be too tired during the day. And then a lot of times guys like this will notice that they just fall asleep in the middle of the day. Just lose energy, just fall asleep. Um, and that oftentimes has to do with the lack of sleep at night they're getting because they're not getting, you know, they're going from stage one to stage two, but then that doesn't let them get in the deep sleep. They don't get restored, they don't get rejuvenated. So they have to sleep longer, they don't feel rested, and they nap during the day. Um, even if you watch their brain during, they might go into like these sleep spindles, remember the things I talked about? That might happen during just walking around in the middle of the day if you, if you have an EEG on them. Their brain will like dip down because they're so sleep deprived from this, from this breathing issue, that uh, they, they're not well rested enough and their body will, will force them to do it during the day. Um, when you talk to people that, that have sleep apnea and then they, they get the CPAP or they get the treatment and then it, it's cured or, or it's solved, it's, it's a, um, it fixes their problem. They feel like they have a new purchase on life. It's like they've, they've been turned down so, so low with all this lack of sleep, this sleep deprivation from sleep apnea. When they finally can breathe again and they sleep at night and they feel rested, they wake up and their attitudes improve. It's just, it's a phenomenal change. Um, so don't be embarrassed that you have sleep apnea. It's much more common. Again, fat guys, big neck, um, and, and males mostly. Um, don't be embarrassed by it. Get it fixed because you will have a much better life when you're getting rest at night, when you're not falling asleep during the day, when you have energy. That's a, that's a much healthier life for you. So seek medical attention with that. Um, oh, and lose weight. Right, secondarily, lose weight. Okay, um, so those are the three sleep disorders I'm going to talk about, and that was sleep. Um, we'll have some good discussions about this, especially the part where I told you don't dream while you're asleep. Um, I think the next thing we're on to is learning and memory, which is a really fun part of the class. So I'll see you on the next one.